place rocks. I love this new space. You know, I'm sitting there, and I just said to Nick, how is someone supposed to speak after that? I'm like, woohoo from all that. But you know, I'm visioning that the place is going to be so filled. You're going to need more and more seats. Keelan's going to have to be up here. You're going to have to bring the speaker up there. There's going to be a choir in the back. The place is just growing. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I always love the energy of coming here. It's just so special to be here. So thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. There's a power within you. It lifts your life to its highest level. It brings happiness, companionship, success. That's success. Health, peace of mind. And as you tap into this power, it will respond to you because this power is within you. All creation originates from this one presence, one power, one source. God is all there is. We are each a creation, a manifestation of this power. We are then made of God's substance. And we are unique individualizations of this power. This is our spiritual identity. God in me, through me, and as me is in me. God in me, through me, and as me is me. Let's say that. God in me, through me, as me, is me. I just wanted to see if you were awake after that meditation. And so, since we're one with God, we intrinsically have the awesome power to create. We create with our thoughts. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. And the thoughts that we habitually think form a pattern in the subconscious mind. And through the law of mind, which, we're, which is also commonly called the law of attraction, they are expressed according to the action, strength, and desire contained within the thought. And so we're creative spiritual beings. How fantastic is that? We're creative spiritual beings. We are meant to live our lives creatively. And I have a fantastic story for you. It's a true story of a man who lived very creatively. It began, this story, in the mid-1400s in Italy when sculptors were commissioned to create a series of 12 large biblical figures for a cathedral in Florence. And it took over 60 years, just 60 years, just to get the first of these two statues to be completed. And then it was in 1464 that the artist named Agostino di Ducio was commissioned to sculpt the third one. And so there's this huge giant block of marble was mined and it was brought, away, brought in from a quarry in northern Tuscany for the piece. And a great amount of effort and extreme expense. And this dude, this person, di Di Ducio, <laughs> sorry, I, you know, I should have just not tried to quilch myself too much. It's not going to work anyway. <laughs> so he spent two years on the project, but he didn't get very far. Now, you can check these facts yourself. Go to Wikipedia. You can check it out. And Deducio only had begun shaping the legs and the feet and the figure when he, I quote, his association with the project ceased. <laughs> kind of sounds like he got canned, right? <laughs> so a few years later, in 1467, another artist, Antonio Rosolino, he was commissioned to take up where this other person left off, this other guy. However, Rosolino didn't get very far either before he was fired too. And so the project was abandoned. And actually, it was abandoned for 25 years, a very long time. So for 25 years, this huge, beautiful block of marble lay there just neglected in uh, the yard of this uh, cathedral. And so in 1501, authorities were determined to find an artist who could take this piece, beautiful piece of marble, and which they called the giant, and turn it into a finished work of art. And so they ordered it to be, quote, raised to its feet, end quote, so that an expert could imagine and, and, and examine it and talk about how it could be and express their opinion. A lot of people weren't consulted. Even Leonardo da Vinci was consulted on this project, but it was this young artist. He was 26 years old, a visionary artist that the church authorities gave the commission to. And so it was on August 16th in 1501 that Michelangelo was given the official contract and he began chipping away at that marble and carving the statue out of the marble. And he worked on this massive biblical figure for years, three years in fact, and in 1504, David, the sculptor David, was complete. Cool, huh? 
And although Michelangelo was an artistic genius in many capacities, he considered sculpting to be the highest form of art because, um, among other things, he reasoned that it mimicked the actual creative process. It mimicked divine creation. So as he sculpted, he worked under the premise that David was already in the block of stone, and all he needed to do was chip away and chip away and chip away and chisel away everything that was not David. Cool, huh? Now, about the block of stone, Michelangelo said, and I quote, I saw the angel in the marvel, marble and carved until I set him free. So Michelangelo used his invisible power to create a work of beauty and art that has withstood the test of time. And so like David, in the stone, waiting to be seen, waiting to be revealed, our job then is to chip away at our conscious mind, to chip away at our consciousness, to get rid of those negative thoughts, those negative beliefs, those negative ideas, those negative attitudes that do not allow the full expression of our divine creativity. And then what we do then is train the subconscious mind because all of creation comes from what's in the subconscious mind. That's why every time I come here, I bring you something, affirmation cards, spiritual jingles, whatever, so that you have tools that you can use. The thing is, though, most of us were not brought up to know our spiritual identity, one with God and being a divine creative being. And so when it comes to our self-esteem, many of us suffer from the lack of it because we don't have we don't have a good self-image. We don't understand ourselves as an expression of God. And we weren't brought up this way. We've negatively judged ourselves. We've compared ourselves to other. And we've, we've criticized ourselves. And you know, can't we just be, you know, I'm going so fast. Am I talking too fast? I'm just like, my 20 minutes, I gotta get it all out my 20 minutes, you know what I'm saying? So, okay. I know, I've been doing that to myself lately. I'm speaking at the International New Thought Alliance in July between Helen Carey, who's like the mega goddess of all of New Thought, with Johnny Coleman, right after, no, right after, right before her, and right after Alice Brown, who's on the INTA. So I keep on having this conversation with myself that God speaks through me, because I am impressing my subconscious mind, because the ego mind gets away with that negative talk. Oh my gosh, what am I gonna say? How am I gonna inspire them? You know, these are the big kids I'm playing with, on and on. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. But it is the life within that urges us to create. It can never be concealed. It can never be shut away. It is ever present and it just simply waits our recognition of it. So spirit is always urging and nugging, nudging and seeking to express within as creativity. However, if we're thwarting it or blocking it or negating this inner urge that's seeking expression, we can have what's called divine discontent. Now, divine discontent occurs when we are not allowing our divine gifts of our, or our divine nature to be expressed. What I want you to know is that this divine urge can never be stopped because spirit can never be stopped. Yeah, you can thwart it, you can block it, but it can never be spot, stopped. And so it shows up then as unhappiness with life or, or a sense of frustration with ourselves or other. Our circumstances in our life can be blocked. Things might not be going our way. Things might not be working in our lives. It shows up as a feeling of unsettled that something is just not right. But divine disconnect can be a good thing. But before I tell you about that, I want you to know that if you're blocking your creative expression, you likely have addictive behaviors. If there's someone you know who has addictive behaviors or some kind of addiction, addiction to food or to drugs or to shopping or whatever it is, some sort of addiction, it's because they are somehow thwarting the expression of spirit, literally depression. You are depressing the spirit. So you never can ultimately depress the spirit. It must always express. Back to divine discontent. So divine discontent then is an urge. It's a divine urge to have a greater expression of yourself, a new, original, and imaginative way to look at something. And divine discontent is really God. It's, it's the universe tapping us on the shoulder, trying to get our attention and saying, woohoo, I want you to express your unique talents and gifts. Woohoo, 
I want you to be more of a powerful crew co-creator with me. Woohoo! I want you to be a greater expression of me. Woohoo! Pay attention. It's kind of like woohoo or woohoo. Pay attention and allow more of your inner creative genius to express. So we all have this inner desire, we all have this inner urge, and it, it operates through the, the channels of creative mind, the impulse to express our divinity. So divine discontent then is the impetus. It is the impetus for us to, to, to heal, for us to grow, for us to expand, for us to express, for discovery and solutions, create solutions to problems. You know, many people believe that creativity is about being a poet or an artist or um, um, uh, what else, or a composer or a musician or something. I remember I used to think, I'm not one of those chicks, I can't create. I mean, you, are, you know there's those ladies who can do all that stuff and they decoupage and I see it all the time, I perform a lot of weddings. They do all these really cool things and I used to think I am not creative. And then someone, and then I realized, wait a minute, I'm creative, first of all, I can dress. And, <laughs> No, seriously, that was the first time I realized I was creative when I could put colors and I'm very conservative today, but that I can do that. And then I also realized that I'm creative because I can write an inspirational talk, right? Those are creative ideas. So many people mistakenly think that creativity is just found only in a, in a quote unquote artistic person. I want to tell you some ideas of creativity. In a large Midwestern city, a gang of thieves had worked out a coordinated routine that was so fast and so smooth that they could break into a clothing store, sweep the clothes off the racks, and be gone before the police could answer the alarm. So this young detective had this idea, and he asked all the clothing merchants to turn one hanger, well, what an accent that was. One hanger, you know what I'm saying? I hear myself when I travel, you know, I go out to California or somewhere, I go, oh boy, I'm such a Long Islander. Okay. And so they took one hanger, face it towards the wall, the next hanger, face it towards the aisle, next towards the wall, next towards the aisle. You got the picture, next towards the wall. Clever, creative idea. And so what happened is the next time, uh, they did this through all the stores, throughout the whole store. So the next time the thieves came along, the th they were very frustrated trying to remove the garments. So of course they got all arrested. So that's an example of creativity. Here's another creative solution. Well, it really is. I'm trying to let you know that there's so many ways that you can express God. Let's not limit ourselves here. So here's another creative solution. A farmer was having trouble keeping hunters off his property. He had all his no trespassing signs. He had all his no hunting signs. And the sign that said, warning, stay out or get shot, was full of bullet holes. <laughs> a little creative thinking and that's how you do it you just ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find knock on the door shall be opened and you talk to spirit god what is the idea i need to know now i have told you a thousand times because i've been here a thousand times that god expresses us love and wisdom love is the energy the glue that keeps us connected and divine wisdom is our direct inheritance divine ideas god what idea do i need to write a new song god what i no, divine idea to have greater expression in my work god what divine ideas to get fantastic people on my TV show. These are the things you ask yourself. And so what the fi fi the, this is what the uh, farmer did. And what happened is he finally posted a sign that said, Rattlesnake Sanctuary. <laughs> Genius, right? Creative, creativity and expression. And so it was his divine discontent with the situation that called for his creativity and unique solutions. Who's the timekeeper? I need to know how much time I have. I have spoken 15 minutes? No, you have 8 minutes. Oh. Okay, anybody, what do you want to know about? Tell me something you want to know about. I got so much. Okay. Um, okay, I'll just tell you. Because, you know, there, I just said to Nick, there's a talk you write and a talk you give. And, um, 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 okay, so, uh, creative visualization is what it's called now. Imagination, creative visualization. Uh, in the 1950s, there was a guy known as Neville. His full name is Neville Gard Goddard. Look Neville up on the internet. All his talks are there. This guy talked all about imagination. In fact, he had a book called Feeling is the Secret. 
Feeling, you've heard me say, is the fuel that propels thought into manifestation. I want to give you a technique. Every morning when you wake up before you get your butt out of bed, think of three things for which you are grateful. And don't just say, oh, I'm really grateful um, that I have a car and I can drive anywhere. What is the feeling? Embrace that feeling. Practice creating feeling. Think of like, oh yeah, the wind in my hair, cool, yeah, oh wow, I'm gonna go down to the boat, yeah, I'm gonna go out and go, Joyce, we're going swimming. Get the idea? Embrace the feeling. And so, um, uh, Albert Einstein said, I'm not enough of an artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. And he also said, logic will get you from A to Z and imagination will get you everywhere. Now you've all heard of that famous Russian study where they did on athletes. Group one, 100% physical training. Group two, 75% training, 25% visualization. Group three, 50% physical training, 50% mental training. And the last group, 25% training, 75% mental thinking. It was group four with 75% of the mental training that to perform to the best. Remarkable, right? Remarkable but true. We've got to use our mind to the biggest capacity that we can. Gosh, I got examples and studies and all this good stuff. So come afterwards and I'll tell it to you. And so, there's a, um, uh, I want to do an experiment right now. Close your eyes. Put your palms up in the air like this. Close your eyes. Imagine I just put a book in your left hand. Actually a heavy book. And now I just stacked another book on top of it. And one more book on top of your left hand. And on your right hand, I've got a helium balloon with a big ribbon attached to it and I just tied it around your wrist. And now I'm tying another helium balloon around your right wrist. And then another helium balloon right around your wrist. And on your left wrist, I just gave you another book on your left hand. And another book on your left hand and another balloon on your right hand. Open your eyes and look at your hands. Open your eyes and look at your hands. Okay? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay, I just want to tell you something really quickly. Um, when you were working with your imagination and you're setting a goal and you have a vision, the faculty of will is very important because it goes hand in hand with the power of emotion. Now we use our will to be determined, to be persistent, to be consistent. We don't force anything to happen. That's will power. You know, that's like when I, oh, I've got five minutes. So that's when you, uh, <laughs> that's when I go to these weddings, Joyce, and I try not to eat all those scallops wrapped in bacon and the shrimp. Oh, I love to talk about food. I miss my daddy. We used to talk about food all the time. And it was covered with a, with a shrimp with a coconut. You dip it. Ooh, that's willpower. That's willpower when you don't do that. But I'm talking about not forcing anything. Unity religion, you're familiar with unity. It's one of the New Thought teachings. Unity calls it the directing power of mind. That is your will. It's the directing power of mind. It's where we deliberately choose or decide upon a course of action. So will is about determination. It's about self-control. It's about self-discipline. And we use our will to stick to our imagining, to stick to a particular vision. Got it? That's what will is all about. So I want you to, I want you to begin to practice. I want you to begin to practice every day invoking feeling, doing it with gratitude. That's why, why do you think Oprah Winfrey, that whole gratitude deal she had? Because she knew, she, was, she actually used to hang out at Johnny Coleman's church in, in uh, Chicago. She knew that feeling was the fuel that brings thought into manifestation. You have to impress the subconscious mind. That's why we say affirmations every day. That's why we sit in the silence. There's silence and there's reflection. Silence is when you do some breathing and you follow your breathing, you become mindful and you get centered. Stillness is when we consciously connect with the authentic self and the originating self. And so we then use our affirmations or the spiritual jingles or prayer to impress the subconscious mind. And so, I would like to end, <laughs> Mr. Seinholder, in the awareness.